Okay. Welcome, everybody. Uh, we are glad that you're here for our last of our winter series of horse management webinars. Uh, today, we're going to talk about winter facility management. And so we have a lot to talk about. So we're going to get started. Just as a reminder, we are going to keep um, pretty much everybody's cameras off and our, we have you all muted. And so we'll do that until it's Q&A time. And at that point, you can uh, turn your cameras on and, and turn your mics on and ask all the questions you'd like. Of course, remember that you can ask questions in the chat box and Rachel and Paige will be pulling those questions out, making sure that we get to them all at the end. So today we have 79 people registered and um, our friends from Germany and France are joining us again. Of course, we have, uh, it looks like the same people kind of from um, Oregon all the way over to South Carolina and then a lot from North Dakota today. So we're glad you're all here. And the number of horses again is very similar to, next, uh, to last week. So a lot have one to five. Um, oftentimes I saw four as the number. Uh, 12 to 15 with 11 being the number there. And then 50 to 75, there was only a couple people that had that many. And so we are glad you're all here. Okay, today we have with us uh, Shane Gelberg, who is the uh, um, engineer and he owns an engineering company. Shane today is gonna to talk to us about structure management. So I'm actually gonna let him introduce himself when we get rolling here. Um, then you get to hear from me. And so, so far I've just introduced things and moderated questions, but today we're gonna to talk about manure. Uh, after that, we'll talk about, uh, Paige is gonna come on and talk about windbreaks, fence maintenance, bedding, blanketing. And then Rachel's gonna round us off again with waters, fence, uh, feed access, pen maintenance and horse care. So that's what's on the agenda for today. And with that, I'm gonna mute myself and turn myself off and I'm gonna hand it over to Shane. Can, can every, I can't see myself. <laughs> we can You're see good and we can you. hear you. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Anyways, my name is Shane Jalberg and uh, I own K2S Engineering. Um, I, I guess we specialize in ag engineering. Uh, we do um, probably mainly livestock facilities and, and waste management and livestock facilities. Uh, you can read through, um, I guess, you can click to the next slide. Um, this just is kind of our, I guess, our, our company statement and uh, what states we're licensed in. I think I'll kind of cruise over that. Uh, you can go to the next. Anyways, I guess we'll start with, um, I'll be honest with you, I, I don't specifically do a lot of horse facilities. We do a lot of livestock facilities, um, but I, I think with livestock, um, we have the same concerns design concerns, the same considerations. Um, I, I know you guys asked me to talk about pens. Well, if you're talking about individual pens in buildings, um, uh, you know, some of this stuff you may know, but I'm gonna assume you don't. Um, if, you're, if you're putting animals in individual pens, um, typically putting them on bare concrete is not a good idea. Um, either you use a sand base or if you have concrete, um, there's a lot of rubber products out there that you can put on top of that. Um, your lanes and traffic areas, um, it's typically the best performance is on, on bare concrete. I mean, the, the animals typically aren't uh, staging on these areas, but uh, you've got a lot of traffic and, and from, from a durability standpoint and, and also keeping the areas clean. Um, concrete is usually your best alternative. Um, on outdoor pens, um, you know, if, if, if you have outdoor pens and they're just earth, you know, you're just using earth base. Um, if you can achieve a three to 5% slope, um, depending on your soil type, of course, um, that's usually your optimum slope. And that's your, that 3% uh, slope would be three feet of, of, of fall or three feet of, of vertical fall over a hundred feet. 
Um, if you have sand base, uh, if, if you have sandy soils, um, that slope probably isn't as critical. Um, animal density outdoor for horses, I, this one is, there might be some different uh, philosophies on it, but if you're with horses, um, if you're at 500 square feet per animal, that's probably a good a good design number to work with. Um, typically, if, if, if we're designing something for uh, breeding beef bulls, we'll shoot for that higher number, try to give them a little more room just so that, you know, uh, it, it just gives them more space. And like I said, I'm not a horse a expert, but I, I think horses tend to have, you know, tend to tend to appreciate their space. Um, probably, you know, you're not going to try to confine horses in, in, you know, 40 to 50 square feet per animal. Um, and then I thought I'd touch on feeding and water, watering areas and, and around those areas you want to consider heavy use protection. Um, typically, like if you put a concrete pad around your water fountain, um, that's that's usually a good idea, um, or at least get a good heart, you know, a good thick gravel base, you know, where you're feeding these areas. If if you're pulling in some kind of a, a feeding bunk, um, you can go to the next slide. I don't know. Can people see me? Because I can't see myself. I'm. Yep, we see you. Okay. Okay. Anyways, uh, building considerations. This is probably the main point. Um, there's there's essentially two types of buildings that you can consider, either a steel barn or a wood barn. Um, I'll tell you right now, when it comes to livestock, I'm biased towards wood. I, I think it holds up better in that type of environment just because you have a little bit you have higher humidity, you have ammonia in the air, and it seems like structurally some of the, the materials tend to hold up better and last longer. Uh, wood also gives you the option of, of if, if you want to build pens or you want to add things on, um, you, you, you know, or, or put uh, hangers or any type of, of, uh, of additional things to, to attach to those wood structures. Sometimes it's easier with wood. Uh, if you want to modify things. Um, as far as the building itself, um, you want to consider, you know, usually I, I tell people you can never put a building high. Um, if you think I have can always fix that. If you're in too low of a spot, that's pretty much impossible to fix. So you know, be be cognizant or be aware of your of your drainage when you're siting your building, especially um, make sure everything drains away from it, or at least that you can achieve that afterwards. Uh, orientation. Um, typically, I run livestock buildings east and west if I can, and and that way, one of the long sides of your buildings are um, facing south and, and you can you can maximize that light, especially when you get up in our climate up here in the Dakotas in the Midwest and, and you get to this time of the year where, where that sun sits pretty low in the south, um, you can get a lot more light penetration if, if, you, if, you're, if you think about that uh, when you're siting your building. Um, ventilation's another thing. Um, you know, if you've got a real dense tree belt on one side of it, you, you probably don't want to build too close to that uh, just to, to allow more airflow uh, so you can manage snow a little easier. Um, the other thing, of course, is, is depending on how many animals uh, you're designing the barn for, you want to think about your animal densities, you know, how many square feet do you want to give each animal, how big do you want to make your individual pens and things like that. Um, where are your feeding and watering areas going to be? Where's your feed storage area is going to be? Where's your vet storage? There's, it's you know a good plan will take you will take you a long ways and, and you'll appreciate it after you get your building done because sometimes if you if you have the up uh oh moment after you put your barn up, um, it's a little harder to to modify those things into your to your building. Um, lighting is another thing to consider when you're looking at materials. Do you want to let a lot of natural light in? Um, or, or, you know, or, are you going to use LED type lights? Are you going to use the more traditional lights? And, uh, 
you know, you can you can really get into the science science of it if you want to consider where your shadows are going to be, and and that way when you're moving animals around, um, you know, they're not as likely to be spooked by some of those those uh, lighting issues that that you might be creating. Uh, you can go to the next slide. <laughs> Here's a couple different building uh, photos. Uh, the, the one on the right, uh, I just want to note real quick, being as we were talking about lighting, you can see that we used a, a kind of a transparent uh, material along the ridge line of that to allow more natural light into that barn. So that's a consideration. You can also do that along along the, the ridge line too, but, but uh, that's usually a good, you know, a, a, uh, light is a good thing to let in. It's a, it's a good thing to expose your animals to, especially this time of the year when we have a limited amount of that. Um, there's a couple different building designs I wanted to touch on. There's a rafter versus a roof truss, and there's a difference. The one on the left is a rafter. It's a, basically, it's just a solid beam that spans um, that spans the barn. The one on the right, that's a roof truss but you'll hear most people call it a rafter. But if you wanted to be technical, the technical term for it is, is a uh, roof truss. Um, personally, I like the rafter if you can make it work and you can, you can, uh, you can build a support post or, or build a strong enough rafter to span a large area. Um, one of the knocks against roof trusses, at least personally, is, is, is they attract a lot of birds. And, and with birds comes a lot of uh, bird manure and, and bird nests. And, and then of course they, they start uh, picking at, if you have insulation in your ceiling, they'll start picking at that. Um, and also it, it disrupts your airflow. So the one on, on the left, the rafter, it does give you some advantages, but you know, if, if you wanna hang fans and things like that, Sometimes the, the roof truss is a better alternative because you got more things to hang fans or lights to, but you can still you can still do it with a rafter type system. Um, you may notice, oh, you can go stay back on that one a second. You may notice how we how the ridge line is open. Um, I know they're going to talk about ventilation, but um, one thing, one of the the biggest things I get calls on is, is buildings that drip water. And, uh, you know, ventilation and airflow is a, to mitigate water dripping in your building. Um, ventilation is a critical thing. And if you look on the building on the right, you can see that it's, it's an OSB plywood that's laid down beside bef before you lay your tin down. And that will mitigate any dripping because the problem with steel is as cold steel will frost up and then as it warms up, it'll start dripping. And that that is, I mean, it not only deteriorates your building materials, it also drips on your animals, drips on your floor and creates a lot of issues. So uh, there is, they do make steel products that have what they call a drip stop or a, it's a kind of a felt material that mitigates that also. It's a little bit of a cheaper alternative. Uh, but I usually recommend people just putting OSB or plywood down before they put their steel. That's that's one of the reasons I'm 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 more partial to to wood buildings because even with steel buildings you can use drip stop and you can use insulation, but your beams and your purlings are still steel and they still still um, frost up and will drip on you. And and a lot of times some of these steel buildings the steel build building manufacturers are getting better, but some of the early steel buildings that they used for livestock, um, a lot of those, those the steel deteriorated quite quickly in that um, because of the ammonia, because of the humidity. And it was something that, you know, they basically just took a steel building and said, hey, let's put livestock in it. And now after 10 years, they figured out, wait a minute, uh, this is a whole different environment than, you know, than, than maybe somebody's shop or just cold storage. Um, you can jump to the next slide. Another option I thought I'd throw in here is a uh, hoop barn. Um, you can, you can, there's definitely some advantages to that. It lets a lot of natural light in. You can span a large area. Um, 
of course, it's considered temporary. Uh, and, and, and there's a little more management to it. You got to make sure you keep things uh, straps and things tight because the wind can can create a few more issues. But but it's definitely an alternative. I mean, the, how you put the roof over your fo floor plan is kind of up to you. Um, if it's something you're thinking about heating or heating areas, um, it's a little bit harder to do with a with a hoop structure. You can go ahead and go to the next one. Next slide. Um, here's another building with, with solid uh, beam rafters that I call and support posts, glue laminated posts. Um, just some of the building specifications. Um, obviously, there's a lot of building codes in North Dakota that don't require that you have to do an engineered building, but uh, of course, being an engineer, <laughs> I would highly recommend that that you consider some of the the engineering parts. Uh, there's wind. There's minimum uh, wind and snow loads for North Dakota. The wind load is essentially the same through throughout. Uh, egg structures are required to be designed to withstand 102 mile an hour wind. Uh, the snow load it depends on your area. Western part of the state, you're looking at about 30 pounds per square foot snow load, and as you go east, you you get up to about 50. Um, and then, of course, there's with that, there's always a foundation analysis um, so that, you know, you properly design those foundations to carry out those loads. Um, there are pre-engineered buildings. You can always ask that question. Is this building engineered? Uh, there are there is a number of, of building packages out there that are already engineered. Typically, the foundation isn't engineered, but um, the whole building is. Uh, some insurance companies do give you a break if, if you design to this ASCE 7-02 that I got noted here, um, but it, it, I would say more often than not, um, we don't see that being a requirement, but some of our, on some of our large livestock facilities, um, we, we do sign kind of a voucher, I call it, for the insurance company so that they can get a discount on their insurance. Um, we're seeing more requirements for engineered buildings after what happened in Iowa this last summer. There was a lot of structures that failed with some of those storms there, and, and a majority of those egg structures are not engineered because typically they're not required to. Um, commercial type buildings are required to be engineered, just so that in case you're wondering uh, why a lot of why you may not be required to do that. Um, and then, of course, building codes that you know, some of the township zoning will say that you have to follow building codes. Um, I, I don't, you know, it's really nothing that's enforced, but there are building codes out there that, that, uh, that you can ask whoever's building it, you know, does this conform to a certain code, a certain building code or not? Of course, materials, we talked quite a bit about that. Um, so go ahead and go to the next slide, I guess. Um, just some of the engineering considerations, uh, you know, um, how are you going to assure, you know, your quality assurance so that you don't have concrete that has a gigantic crack in it when you get done, uh, things you want to talk to your contractor about, you know, so that, that when you do have issues and, and things that appear to be failing, um, you have some recourse. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. And then, of course, you always want operation and maintenance or an operation and maintenance plan. Like if you have a hoop barn, um, you you want to you want to be checking your strap tightness that's holding your tarp on. You know, at least after every went, you know, if it if it blows forty miles an hour and sixty mile an hour gusts like it's supposed to the next two days, that's something you might want to check before that. You know, check your strap tightness before those that wind event happens, just so that that uh, you're mid, you know, you're protecting yourself against a failure. Um, same thing with ventilation, any, any, any fans and, and, you know, you just want to make sure that you're doing proper maintenance and you're inspecting it, make sure fasteners aren't coming, you know, uh, like on roof steel, if the fasteners are starting to pull out, it's something that you want to bring to your contractor's attention. You know, did he use the right type of fasteners? Did they actually, you know, torque them down to the correct, um, 
you know, it's, it's, it's just things you want to keep an eye on. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. If there so is that, enough. yep, that is it. That is your oh, last slide. It. Okay. How many minutes was that? You were pretty much right on 20. All right. Uh, so with that, we're gonna uh, we're gonna have Shane stick around and show. So we're gonna um, I will start my video here. There we go. Uh, and so we're gonna move then into manure management, which is something that comes along with when you have a barn or when you have some kind of um, pens outside. You do need to manage your manure. So that's what we're going to talk about. And so when you guys registered for this webinar, uh, we had some an area where you could put questions in. And so a lot of the questions we got um, for the series, we were able to take some of those questions out from each webinar um, topic. And our presenters were able to kind of answer some of those throughout. And so for manure management, I decided to pull them out and tell you guys what you asked. And so um, for manure management, your question was manure management, uh, manure removal during extreme conditions, uh, moving frozen manure. And then some of you, I thought this was really fun, just chose to shout manure with all capitals. So manure uh, was one of your questions with facilities. And so um, I'm going to go through a few things that I think are important for you, and then uh, let's chat. So if you have ideas of things that you've done um, with any of these topics, so removing manure during extreme conditions, any of the things that I'm going to talk about as we go, go ahead and type them in the chat. I think this is a good time to share some of those ideas with your fellow horse owners. So as I was sitting last night thinking about what to tell you guys, um, be, because some of the questions were like, how do we move um, frozen manure? Um, and so the first thing that I thought it is, what kind of equipment do you have? What do you have access to? Do you have a pitchfork and a whole corral that you're trying to do? Or do you have a bobcat and a tiny pen? What are you dealing with here? And does your equipment match what you're actually trying to do, the job that you're trying to do? Uh, where are you going to stack it and why there? So a lot of you want to remove the manure, but where are you going with it? Uh, whether that's out of a barn or out of a corral, what is your plan? And then why are you putting it there? Are you putting it there because it's the most convenient spot when it's uh, blowing 40 miles an hour and it's minus 20 out? Uh, are you putting it there because it's the most logical place that you can turn it in the spring? Are you putting it there because you're going to mitigate fly issues with having your manure pile there in the summer? Um, are you putting it there because of access so when you want to go spread it? So all things to think about. Uh, how will you manage it once it thaws? And so we have frozen manure that you guys now want to move, but then how are you going to manage it? Can you do something now to save yourself time and trouble later? Uh, and then composting is something that if you've been on these webinars, you know I like it. And so we're going to talk just a quick little thing about composting. I do have the link for the webinar where we talked about manure management this past spring, where I really kind of went into more detail on composting. And so we can always check that later. And then we'll talk just a little bit about spreading considerations as well. So barn manure and pen manure, um, two different kinds of manure still going to have to think about the same management considerations. And so you can see on the left hand side, we have the bobcat in a barn. Uh, we're pushing out our manure, we're pushing out, uh, we're cleaning up, and then we're going to come back in with some bedding. And so that's probably happening, you know, depending on on your standards for your animals or how many animals you have in that area, what that looks like. Um, you know, you're cleaning once a day, once a week, maybe you're doing every day pitching out uh, into a wheelbarrow so that it doesn't freeze in place, but then maybe once a week you're doing a full clean out or once every two weeks. And so you can see in this barn, um, something that was done when it was built is they, they thought a lot about uh, cleaning this area out where their horses are um, and these pens are. And so they were able to open all the gates push out all at once and then come back in and close those gates back up. And so just some things to think about is how can you make the job that you really don't like easier and more efficient for yourselves? Uh, and then on the very right hand side of the screen, you can see where we have just a pile of manure out in a pen. 
And so what, why I put this up here is I want you to think about when you look at this pile. So if you take the manure and you're like, the best thing I can do for my horses is I want the front of the pen clean and the back of the pen dirty. Okay, so you're pushing all of this manure up in the back. But then what happens in the spring when that starts to thaw? Uh, you can already see this is kind of more of a spring picture and you can already see that there's a little bit of a low area because we pushed a little too much. We got a little aggressive when we were pushing and we started digging out and we never filled that in uh, before winter. And so we, we dug out a little bit. Now we're pushing up frozen manure. There's probably some snow mixed in there because it's outside. It's going to freeze in the spring when it thaws. We're going to have a big water hole in the middle of our pen. So how can we manage that? Okay. The reason I put the middle picture in here is for the next few slides. And so uh, you can see whether you're stacking manure on the right hand side outside in your pen. So my suggestion for that would be instead of pushing your manure up in the pen, let's put it in a stacking area where we can do something with it in the spring if you are going to have your animals in that pen in the spring. So you'll remember last year it was super wet. We had a lot of discussions about mud on animals and sometimes that mud is manure. And what does that look like? How do we manage for that? Let's manage for that now. How about we take that manure and put it in a stacking area? That's not the pen. And then same thing here, you can see in the middle picture, they've used the bobcat and pushed that manure out and that bedding out. And now it's setting at the end of the barn. If you can see my mouse here. So is that the best area to leave it? Most of the time, that's where we want to leave it. We just want to hurry up and clean out our manure so that we can move on to the next thing. Because the next thing is taking care of our animals or doing stuff with our animals. But is that the best place to leave it? What happens if it freezes there? What happens if you need access to that door? Where do we move it? How do we move it? Uh, and so again, all things to think about. So manure stacking and stockpiling guidelines for North Dakota, short-term manure stockpiles. This is something where you have uh, nine months you can put this manure in a location, you can leave it there for nine months or less, and you cannot use the same location from year to year. Whereas if we have a permanent manure stockpile, that's something that can be used over nine months, um, but it also involves a soil investigation to make sure, uh, so you can use that pile every year or that same location every year, but we do a soil investigation uh, and regular oversight just to make sure that we're not contaminating any kind of groundwater um, or have any issues with leachate. And so where you're putting your manure, uh, are you dealing with sandy soils that have rapid permeability? Or are you dealing with clay soils with slower permeability? And so how are those nutrients, while they're frozen now, they're going to thaw in the spring. And so how do we manage um, that and, and pick a correct site? And how you do that is to know what kind of soil types you have on your operation, where those soil types may be different, uh, and then pick that appropriate spot. Depth to groundwater and location of surface water are something that um, couple of the first questions if you call me or Paige or Rachel, that's one of the first few things we're going to ask you is, where's your water at? Where does it run? Uh, and what does that look like? Okay, no matter if you have a, a short term or a long term, manure stockpiles cannot be located in gravel pits along streams or lakes within a floodplain or 50, mi uh, 50 feet of a private water uh, supplies like a well or 100 feet from a public supply water well. So uh, we just, a lot of this is common sense. When you call me and you're like, well, I want to put it in a hole. And then I tell you, no, no, we can't do that. But if you call and you're like, you know, I thought about this. Um, I know that the, the creek runs over here, but I'm going to put it over here instead. And I know that there's, um, you know, our well is this far away and we're this far away from the barn. And we're th th Those are all good things. You've really thought through uh, the common sense of where to put that manure. Okay, so we're going to go back to thinking about that middle picture where uh, there was a nice pile of manure. So we pushed it out. We're going to assume that those producers put that manure at, on their stacking area, at their appropriate stacking area, but now they have a nice pile of manure. What are they going to do with it? One of the easiest things you can do in the spring as it starts to thaw is start to mix it. When you're mixing it, you're going to start composting it. As you're composting it, it's going to burn down. As it burns just down, it becomes less for you to have to deal with, but it also becomes a more stable product, which makes me happy uh, and is better for pollution considerations. And so 
uh, you're going to push it all up in the winter and then we're going to come in in the spring and we're going to start turning and making compost. So I threw a few slides in here. I'm not going to go through the composting process. Like I said, uh, we have those these uh, slides in another presentation. I just put them in here so you would see them as you're going through. And remember to click on that presentation in the resources at the end and go and watch that. Uh, so we just talk about you know turning and the appropriateness of timing when to do that and how to do that, uh, and then when it's done. So, okay. So something else. All right. We have pushed this pile up. We are maybe going to compost it, but maybe not. Maybe you're like, mm, not my thing. Okay, so now you wanna work with a custom manure hauler. So here are some things to think about. And you guys have asked these questions. How do we work with these guys? How do we get these guys to our place? Uh, so let's talk about that. So things you need to know about working with a custom manure hauler. And so these guys are used to doing jobs that last uh, days, a day or more. Um, a long time at a location. They're hauling 200 to 500 loads when they're at these places, um, hauling mostly North Dakota for beef guys. Now we want them to come and haul manure for us and we might have a half a load for them. Um, and so what you need to know to be able to tell them is how much manure do you have? How much do you have uh, when you want them to come spread it? Where are they spreading it? So this is something where you can work with your local neighbor, a local um, landowner, uh, or if you have your own land too, you can spread on your own land. That's just fine. But it is your responsibility as the manure owner to figure out where you're going to put it. It's not your hauler's responsibility. And so your haulers are very likely not going to come if you're like, well, I need you to spread my manure, but I don't have a place to put it. Uh, that is something that they really want you to work on and you to figure out uh, so that they can continue doing their jobs. The other reason that we talked about earlier is where you're going to put it and why that's really important. Can you get to the Mr. Can they get to the manure storage area? So they have big equipment that we'll look at next. Can they get in there? Can they maneuver around and make their equipment fit? Not all of them have smaller um, bobcats and such. A lot of them are working with big payloaders, which might be fine if you put it in an area where they can access it. And then, of course, you have to pay them for their job. So here's what some of our equipment looks like. Uh, we do have some haulers in the state that are actually using uh, towed trailer or towed spreaders. And so they have a tractor with a spreader. Uh, these are smaller spreaders. Most of our guys have bigger ones. These are just a few of the smaller ones that I just wanted to show you. So you have an idea of what this equipment looks like and why I said it's super important to know um, what will fit where when you're wanting to spread. So here's some more equipment. A lot of our guys have truck mounted spreaders in the state. And then something else to consider is when you're feeding your animals, especially if you have a handful of animals in an outdoor lot, you're putting hay out there and it's cold out and you don't wanna take your twine and your net wrap off uh, and you get a pile like that on the left side. So what happens is um, when the haulers come in and they spread for you, that gets wrapped around their beaters and then they have to take time and cut it off. Uh, and so they'll charge extra for that. So just know that that is something if you pick it up, uh, it doesn't wrap around their beaters and they won't charge you extra. So of course there's at home spreading options as well. Not all of you are gonna um, have enough manure for a custom hauler. You're not gonna want that. Maybe every other year you'll think, oh, I'll have a custom guy come in, but sometimes I wanna spread my own as well. And so there are smaller pull type ground driven spreaders out there. Um, typically you would pull them with, a, with an ATV, a lawnmower. Some people pull them with horses. Uh, those are always fun videos to watch. And so uh, some examples are listed here. And then I just went through and did the math for you and you can see this later, just um, how to convert bushels and tons so you know how much manure you have uh, if you're interested in one of these little spreaders. And so this is what they look like. So much smaller, if that's the route you plan to go, then you can plan a lot differently for where you're gonna put your manure and how you're gonna manage that during the winter. Okay, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Paige. So let me give her access and I will be quiet. All right, everyone. So let's talk a little bit about outdoor shelter options. And one type of, of shelter is going to be a windbreak and really a certain any type of windbreak is going to be needed in North Dakota. We get extremely cold. The wind chills are, are very dangerous. So some sort of windbreak is needed. Um, 
this diagram here kind of shows an example of the effects of a windbreak. In summary, if you have an adequate windbreak, you're going to reduce that wind speed about 60% or so, and that'll vary a little bit. Oftentimes, the area that's protected by your windbreak is going to be up to eight to 10 times the height of the windbreak. So keep that in mind that a lot of times, um, you know, if we look at the trees here, about five times out, they're still reducing the wind velocity by about 50% and it'll continue on a little bit less than that the further you go to the right of the windbreak. Some of the um, permanent and portable options that are available and pretty common in North Dakota are tree rows. That's gonna be a permanent option. That's gonna take a long time to establish. So if you don't have a tree row currently, um, you can certainly look into establishing one. Uh, wood fencing options can be both permanent or portable. Straw bales are often used as a portable uh, windbreak. And then also there's some steel fence options and the slope of the land can use, be used as a windbreak as well. You wanna keep in mind when you're looking at what to use for horses anyway, is, is safety is paramount. I mentioned the steel windbreaks. A lot of those are designed for uh, cattle or livestock and they're not the safest option. The size of the gaps might be not ideal. They can get a hoof or a head stuck through there and really cause some severe injuries. You wanna make sure that there's smooth edges, there's no screws or nails or those sort of things. And then you wanna think about where your windbreak is in proximity to feed and water and um, buildings or shelter areas, other shelter areas as well. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So here's a few pictures that I wanna share. Um, when this first picture on the left, you can notice that there's, you can't really see it real well, but it's kind of a V-shaped straw bale windbreak, just a single layer of straw bales. And behind that is a, a shelter belt full of trees as well. So it's kind of double protection in a sense. Um, you may need to provide straw bales in front to prevent or something in front of the straw bales, sorry, straw bales in front of some of these other portable options to prevent them from sliding or moving when the wind is really uh, strong. So a lot of times we've seen where these portable options, like in the lower right hand side, you get those big windy days that are coming up this week and those portable panels will actually slide around. So making sure they're anchored, secured to um, posts in the ground or using some bales that can prevent them from moving is a good option. If we look back over here, a couple other things to point out about this windbreak is notice that the feed is on the downward wind side of the windbreak. That's an ideal um, place to position it. There's a little bit of a slope to this land. So the windbreak is up on top of a hill um, and then it's bedded again on the, the downward side. And we'll talk about bedding in a little bit. One other comment I wanna make is there's approximately 10 or so horses in this particular pen and there's two separate feeders. So making sure that you provide enough um, access to feed for the number of horses that you have. Then let's go and talk about these uh, kind of engineered design shelters that can be either installed permanently or be portable movable ones as well. They're very common in the area. I like the design here because it does have the wood on the back of the shelter. We see some that are just the, the frame with the tin over it. And that causes a risk if your horse were to back into it, start itching its tail on the, the fence or um, kick, it could kick a hole through the tin and cause some injury. So always make sure you have at least four feet of a quick kick panel in your shelter. Also the minimum space for those shelters, the one that's pictured here um, would maybe safely house up to two horses, assuming those horses get along well. The recommendation is to provide about 240 square feet in an outdoor three-sided shelter like this um, for two horses, and then add an additional 60 square feet for each additional horse. So 240 square feet, for example, would be like a 12 by a 20 foot shelter. And that'd be adequate again for a couple horses, assuming they get along well. Another option that's fairly affordable and easy to use is again, these stack straw bales. So we have a picture here of too high. Keep in mind if you're doing that to make sure that those bales are very sturdy and they are secured quite well with, with twine or net wrap. So these are some net wrap bales. So the horses aren't going to be able to destroy them quite as easily versus the flax bales that are in this single row in this picture. 
they just had some um, biodegradable twine, Cecil twine on them. So those ones do decay and the bales start to disintegrate and fall apart over time. This windbreak shelter here um, has been set up for about four or five years. Uh, so over time, they start to sort of fall apart and decay. And then you can either compost those bales down, move them out of the area and replace them with some uh, more attractive looking bales if you wish. So what if you don't have any windbreak protection, no shelter available? We get the questions about blanketing. And the majority of horses out there handle the cold in North Dakota very well, and most do not require blanketing. But it might be something to consider if there is truly no shelter available. Um, blanketing can provide a, a temporary kind of portable shelter for the horse. If your horse is in poor body condition score of a three or less, and we've covered body condition score in some previous webinars, know that blanketing is recommended at that point. If they're very old or very, very young, blanketing might need to be considered. If the cold conditions are also combined with wet conditions. So typically in the middle of winter, we don't get that wet snow, but in the fall, the first snows of the year, and then in the spring, a lot of times those rain mixes or that really heavy wet snow can penetrate the horse's hair coat and they lose that insulation factor and they become very susceptible to the cold in those instances. So if we combine very cold temperatures with also wet, that might be a time to consider blanketing, assuming they have no other shelter. Another option or another time to blanket is if they're not acclimated to our cold climate. So if you're shipping a horse up from a Southern climate and they don't have much of a hair coat, they're gonna need some extra protection. Um, if you're body clipping your horses to make it easier to cool them out after riding or you're showing throughout the winter and you don't want them to, to have as much of a hair coat, um, they're gonna need a blanket as well. And then something we forget too is that some of our horses are kept under lights. And what I mean by that is if they're under um, artificial lighting for 16 hours a day or more that inhibits them from growing a thick heavy winter hair coat because horses um, are sensitive to the daylight and that's what triggers their hair growth. So keep in mind that if you're bringing your horses in and the lights are on consistently for that 16 hours they're not going to grow enough hair and, and they might need a blanket. Hair coat continues to grow until the winter solstice in December so if you start blanketing you know in October and November your horse is going to have a shorter hair coat and actually they start growing in their hair coat in July. Um, they start shedding their summer hair coat and their winter hair coat is coming in and then after that winter solstice in December if you go check out your horses right now they're starting to shed some of their winter coat very slowly it doesn't happen overnight but they're starting to loosen up some of those hairs. And again, just a reminder that, that that hair coat traps warm air against the body. So sometimes uh, what blanketing does is flatten that hair and can actually decrease the insulation effect. So you need to make sure that you have the appropriate blanket for the temperatures out there. Um, for instance, if you were to just go put a, a light blanket on with no insulation factor on your horses this time of year, it's going to flatten that hair and will actually leave them colder um, and less warm than if you were to just leave them unblanketed in the first place. So again, um, really research the type of blankets they're gonna use. There's ones with no insulation, what we call a medium insulation, and then a really heavy blanket or heavy insulation that can have up to you know, 400 grams of that, that fill that keeps them warm. Other things with blanketing to remember is to check for dangling straps daily. If you're gonna blanket, you need to make sure that you're making sure that it fits appropriately. If it's wet, it needs to be removed. Um, and, and definitely be removing that blanket regularly to make sure you're checking on their body condition score and, and the fit as well. I'm gonna to touch briefly on thinking about where snow drifts are gonna land in the winter. This year, we've been lucky to not have a whole lot of snow, but if we think to a few years back, we had some significant issues um, and that can prevent access to, not only to you getting to the barn and to your horses, but think about where you're placing your feeders and where your waters are located and your fences as well. Um, in this picture down in the lower right hand corner, imagine if you just had this windbreak as shelter and you went about 50 or 100 feet out from that windbreak to place your feeders because that's where wind protection would be um, you know, significant. And 
in this picture here in a snowy year, those feeders and waterers and shelter would be completely covered by, by snow drifts. So uh, keep in mind that you're gonna have an accumulation of snow on both sides of your windbreak, both on the uh, windward drift and then also the leeward drift and keep your feeders and buildings and all of the equipment and materials that you need to take care of your horses in winter far enough away so they're not completely consumed by some of these snow drifts. In the picture on the top right, this picture was taken from standing inside the building and that building has to be shoveled out on snowy years almost on a daily, um, daily schedule because it does drift in because it was placed too close to the windbreak. And you don't always have an option of where you're placing your pens and your shelters, but keep that in mind. Also know that a lot of times we fence right alongside of our shelter belts. In that instance, these fences that are right next to the trees are completely under snow and not going to do a whole lot of a whole lot of good. So let's talk a little bit about winter fence maintenance then. The weight of the snow and ice can break wires, um, completely bury the fence as in the case in this picture. And you're gonna need to go in and remove that. And I say that because you would think that no animal would want to walk over or walk through a snow drift this high. But as those snow drifts harden, um, the horses are, are well fed. Uh, so that should keep them close to the bale feeder. But once they're done eating, they might get a little bit bored and go exploring and play around on top of those snow drifts. And they're able to walk right over top of the fences. The risk is, is if they fall through or fall in, um, they can get entangled or entrapped in the fence and, and really cause some problems. So keep that in mind. Here we have a picture of a horse that is um, drinking out of a waterer that is about a two to three foot high waterer off the ground, but that has completely drifted in in this, this really snowy winter. So while this might be a temporary solution to just shovel out so they can find the top of the water, eventually you're going to want to go in there with some heavy equipment and get that, that snow removed so that they can easily access their, their feed. The other thing I want to talk about is just keeping a fence visible in the winter and maintained will often keep horses in. And I'm talking, I guess, about electric fences. So the struggle we have with electric fences is that they don't always work so great in the winter. They can short out from the snow and the ice accumulation. Our solar chargers and our battery chargers don't work very well in the cold and the, the decreased daylight. So if you can switch to a, a plug-in or a, uh, that type of fencer, that would be better. Oftentimes the earth ground fails. Um, so you might need to move to what we call a, a two, kind of a, a two wire grounding system where one wire is on insulators and that's your hot wire, your electric wire and another wire on your fence is, is grounded. So it's attached directly to the post to provide that ground because we just don't get a good ground in um, cold winter conditions. So keep that in mind that our electric fences typically don't work very well. But what we find with horses is that having that visible barrier there, they're typically not going to test it as much anyway. So even if you are struggling with keeping the voltage up in your electric fence, keeping the wires up and maintained and, and pulled tight enough that will help keep your horses in assuming they're, they're well fed. The other thing to consider is that blankets will often inhibit the uh, electric fences from impacting the horse as well. It kind of insulates them against the shock. Probably the biggest issue we see in winter is the, the weight of the snow and the ice that can break boards, can break wires, um, the cold weather makes the wires tighten up and shorten and can snap them um, quite easily as well. And then we often see down tree branches that may fall on fences when um, you get some ice storms going on. So check your fences regularly. Having a horse entangled in them is not something that we want to have happen. The last thing I'm gonna talk about today is, is the importance of bedding your horse in the winter. Whether you are inside or outside, um, you should provide some source of bedding for your horses. And there may be some variations on what you choose according to availability, price, and uh, just your personal preference as well. So this bedding is gonna provide an insulating layer against the frozen ground. Try to make it at least 12 inches deep if you can. Um, and that bedding is going to serve to keep the animal clean because it absorbs the moisture. Common materials in North Dakota are straw. Straw is great for outside. We have a variety, wheat, oat, barley, and flax. Straw can be a little bit tougher to pick through. So if you're keeping your horses in stalls, whether it's heated or unheated, um, cleaning a, 
a straw bedded pen by hand is more challenging than cleaning a, a wooded uh, bedded pen. So whether the, let's look at the different types of wood products that are available as well. There's wood chips, wood shavings, sawdust and pellets, and they're all byproducts of, of wood um, production and processing. They seem to be easier to pick through for most people. Um, they may not be as available in some areas and the expense may be higher than straw. So really this is gonna vary from location to location, whether you're keeping horses in stalls or outside is the preference that you choose. Straw isn't as absorbent as wood, um, but often is easier to come by and maybe a little bit cheaper. So you have to weigh those pros and cons. Some of the other materials I wanna mention that are available that horse people have used for bedding are peat moss, which is highly absorbent, but maybe a little bit more expensive and not as easy to find. Newspaper shreds, um, corn stalk shreds, dried compost. So that's actually taking thoroughly composted manure and reusing this bedding that's not as common in the uh, horse industry as it is in some of the other livestock industries, but some people do use that. And then others consider um, bedding on sand as well. All right, I think I'm gonna turn it over to Rachel and we will answer questions at the end. Sorry, okay. Uh, so we're going to move on to waters, and I know everybody this time of year loves to walk out and see the water that's that's right in the middle of this picture, the one that's overflowing, and and a whole bunch of people or a whole bunch of things are wrong. And this is actually a picture from Paige, and the first thing she said is because everybody wants to remember the day that you walk out and see that, right? So the one thing that I want to mention with waters is check them daily and best to check them twice a day so that you know um, right in the morning that they're getting watered all day long and then before you go to bed at night uh, check them again to make sure that that water is still on for the night um, so that you don't essentially wake up to something like that middle picture. Um, so I have three different types of waters in there besides the ice covered one. Um, there are horse specific waters up on the top and they're more of a bowl um, and then there's if you have say four pens or two pens that needed need to be watered at one same place, the lower picture has two sides to it and that one feeds four different pens. So that's, you know, knowing, knowing what kind of water you're going to need when you walk into a situation or when you start um, planning out pens for your operation, that's important to, um, to know that. And also knowing, you know, if you do go with the single bowl water, you're gonna to have to put one in every pen. So then you're maintaining four waters instead of just one. Um, looking at heat tape, heat tape in a water uh, such as the one in the lower right hand corner is nice to um, cover the pipe with so that you can plug it in when winter time comes around to make to ensure that that pipe stays warm. A lot of the times um, the hole that the pipe is coming out of provides enough heat, but when we get into extreme conditions in North Dakota, just about anything can happen um, when we get that cold. Another option is a tank heater. Um, even in these water tanks, um, like I'm showing here, you can put a small tank heater in to ensure that that, that water stays at that ideal condition, which is uh, 45 to 65 degrees Fahrenheit. And I know everybody knows that, um, you know, an average thousand pound horse drinks 10 to 12 gallons a day. So that's, I mean, if you have more than one horse out there, that's quite a bit of water you need to provide. But also think, um, you know, that average is in the summertime. And in the summertime, they're getting a lot of water from their forage, from the grass on the ground um, as they're roaming around the pasture. In the wintertime, the hay that they're eating is maybe 10%. Um, moisture. So 10 to 15 percent moisture. So they're actually going to increase the amount of water that they're drinking in the winter time. And just as a reminder, water actually helps regulate their body temperature as well. So they need water to make sure that their body stays warm. So it's not only important in the summertime to prevent dehydration from overheating, but also in the wintertime to prevent um, any hypothermia as well. 
you want to protect this from prevailing winds. So if, if you have the option, um, the lower right hand picture has that nice shelter belt um, able to keep it out of the way um, so that it prevents any issues from freezing up. Sometimes we don't have that option, but just thinking about an option that may help um, when you're setting up windbreak to, to make sure that that's included. Um, and I know Paige had mentioned that distance between from the windbreak to you know five times out can always reduce the amount of wind or wind chill that's coming at that. So some other things that you wanna make sure of is when, when that area around, around the water gets icy, um, you wanna kind of maintain that. Um, and when it gets bad enough, you're gonna wanna chip it away and move it out, out of the way so that it doesn't accumulate and you don't have any issues with injuries, um, horses walking up there and slipping and falling, or people too. When you use a large water tank, something that you have to fill maybe with a hose, you wanna consider um, keeping cords outside the fence because you're gonna need a tank warmer for that. Um, what the, when the tank warmer is plugged in, you want to use a GFCI outlet and make sure to drain that hose, the hose that you use to fill it. Drain that hose regularly because that will ensure that you'll be able to fill the tank every time. The other thing is, is with those big water tanks, you want to partially cover the tank um, so that it can re retain its own heat. This will actually help a lot so that you don't have to use as much energy with that tank here to keep a space open. When you cover it, it's able to retain its own heat or even heat from that tank heater. Heated buckets are an also, also another option that are commonly used, um, usually in, in smaller confined areas. So another thing we wanna talk about is feed access and pen maintenance. Um, and a lot, of the, a lot of this has been covered already. Um, Paige had talked about with, with your wind breaks, you wanna, you wanna make sure, be conscious where, where everything's sitting between the shelter, the feed and the water. Um, so absolutely when you're doing that, think about where you're putting all these things and making sure that those horses can easily get to them because you need all three of those to get through the winter. They need feed to eat, water, and shelter. Keep feed away from those wind breaks to make sure that they don't get covered when the snow drifts in. Um, and you know, everybody said this, so I'm just gonna repeat it again. A higher location in the, in the pen is better um, because they're not down where, where it might get too low and end up with you know, water in the spring. Um, but you also want to make sure that that they're e easily able to get to water, a water source. So when you're talking snow removal, you want to plan ahead. Uh, when you're taking that snow out, you have to make sure you have a place to put it, much like the manure piles that Mary talked about. Um, plan ahead, make sure you're not blocking any feed source, you're not blocking a gate, you're not blocking a building. And make sure that you have adequate space for your herd. And that, um, you know, if your herd gets along really well, then, then you're know, making sure you maintain that space. But if, if you have somebody who's a little bit more of a bully, then, then you're going to need a larger space to make sure that everybody can get away from each other. Uh, regular maintenance in these paddocks will ensure that draining in the spring and also faster drying um, so that, that they aren't in a mud hole when springtime comes around. And then preparing for winter storms. Um, a lot of us are looking at that kind of the high winds that are coming up today. Not everybody wants to be out and feeding in, but you, need, you know you need to have your animals taken care of. So make sure there's enough forage available. And like Paige talked about, um, one bale feeder is enough for about six animals. So if you have more than six animals, make sure that there, there's two bale feeders out there or uh, enough if you're feeding, say small squares, enough piles so that there's more than more piles than animals so that they can safely get to all of them. Um, make sure that you're feeding closer to a windbreak so that they don't have to move very far to get to it and that they stay warm while they're there. If you do have to go out to feed, make sure you have a safe path to the barn. Um, if you're in a winter storm, 
most of the time we want to make sure you have those animals taken care of before you go in. But if you have to go out to feed, um, you know, safety is key. Make sure you have maybe a rope from the house to the barn to ensure that you get there or a safe place or a warm place to stay in the barn if you need to stay there. Make sure you have a generator available with three days of fuel to run it. Um, that way you know any heating systems, water pumps and waters, lighting. If you need to plug in your tractor to ensure it starts, um, all of those are imperative so that when, when the winter storm is here or when it's over, you're able to get things started and start moving snow and get to your animals to make sure that they have what they need. So the last one is horse care. And I know a lot of people in the winter time think, oh, you know, hooves don't grow that fast in the winter, so I don't need to worry about it. Um, but that's not the case. You still need to stay on a regular foot trimming schedule, um, maintain your regular foot care throughout the winter, and pick their feet regularly. This will actually help with those snowballs that are just, just a pain in the, in the tuchus when, when all that snow comes around and your horses are walking around on those. Um, bring them in, get them cleaned out, make sure that they're on a regular schedule, just keeping them trimmed regularly will help with this. And then as you can see in the picture, um, that is actually a pad that goes underneath the shoe for snowballs um, to ensure that, that they don't stick in there as, as easily. Um, if you are maintaining your horse, horses shod in the winter time, make sure that they have cleats along with it so that they, they don't slip and fall when ice comes around. And then when you're exercising in the cold, uh, use common sense. Don't overwork those horses and make sure to cool them down properly out of out of the wind. You don't want them hot or wet when you're turning them back out. And you want to avoid any icy conditions. So if the yard is just a sheet of ice, that's not a good place to be riding in. And any deep snow can actually lead to tendon injuries. So I want, want to mention just to avoid that. Usually if you're exercising in the winter, um, you're looking at kind of an indoor situation in North Dakota, unless it's like it is right now, which is really nice but you still need to use that common sense and those rules along with it to ensure that you don't injure or um, end up with any illness because if they're hot before they go back in that pen um, and they aren't cooled down properly, you can end up with some issues like that. So it looks like we've got a couple of questions. If Paige and Mary and Shane want to turn their videos back on. Now's a great time where if you want to type questions in the chat box, you can, or we can unmute your microphones and you, you can unmute your microphone and ask them to us verbally as well. And before we go to questions, I just want to point out these resources before I turn my screen share off. So um, on all of the presentations, we have had resources at the end. Those also get posted online. And so uh, you can see on here, we just put a handful of hot links that you can go to to look at uh, things that we've talked about as far as um, in our management or health care plans. Um, uh, health horse, um, manure pastures and facilities, and all the things. And so a lot of the stuff we talked about today, you'll find on our resources page. With that, uh, questions? Or comments? So as many of you know, this is the last in our winter series. And so if there are things that you would like us to um, chat about, if we potentially do this again in the spring, we're, we're really just kind of feeding off of the participants and what you guys are suggesting. And so if you're like, yes, we should keep doing these in our uh, reviews that we're getting from you, then we'll keep doing them. And if not, uh, we'll take a break for a little bit. But yeah, this is the last in our winter series. Mary, this is Shane. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I, I just wanted to mention that um, on my first slide there, we do have a YouTube page, K2S Engineering YouTube page, and we've got several 
uh, YouTube videos of livestock confinement barns in there. If, if you want to, there's no horse facilities, but there are, there are buildings in there in case, in case you want to browse those. Yeah, and I can add that to our resource page as well, uh, just in case folks have questions about, uh, you know, what different facilities might look like. Yes. I see a question came in the chat about, is there one stall bedding type that is preferred for a horse's health over another? And when it comes to that answer, it, it depends, it's not an easy answer, but straw is the least absorbent. So straw is typically going to leave the pens a little more damp and wet. Um, peat moss has been shown to be the most absorbent, but can be harder to get your hands on and has some other um, downsides to it as well. And, and the wood products kind of fall right in the middle. So really it's, it's a variation there. Um, you wanna think about, again, what's accessible and affordable and easy for you to clean out. And then also just keep in mind that you may need to clean a little bit more often. Um, what I recommend some people do is, is to go in the stall and, and kind of you know, squat down at, at the floor level and, and see how wet it is, what the smell is like, what that ammonia smell is like. And that might tell you whether you need to clean your stalls more frequently, maybe switch up and try a different material um, or add more bedding to the mix. Okay. We appreciate you guys sticking with us today. Uh, we know this was a little bit longer, but we had a lot to talk about, all things that you guys sent in and, and asked questions about. And so we appreciate that. If there are no other questions, there was a question about um, if we'll be sending the links out and Rachel answered that, yes, we will be. Um, those are sent out uh, in order for you to join this, you had to register. And so I have your email address and I will send those out. It'll take a couple days just to make sure um, we once we get it edited and I'm able to add everything to the website. So yep, this will be sent out. I think with that, we will end and we just appreciate all of you again joining us, whether it was for the entire series or just for one webinar. Uh, we appreciate you and thank you so much. And feel free to email any of us and ask us questions um, or suggest other topics. Rachel, our page, any parting comments? Thanks for joining everyone. Thanks for coming in. We love and to see everybody. <laughs> and a special thank you to Shane uh, for joining us today too. We really appreciate having industry come in and help us with some of these things once in a while. So with that, I will stop the recording and we are done for the day.